Dr. Catherine Dethy is a clinical ethicist with Alberta Health Services, providing frontline clinical ethics consultation at the Royal Alexander Hospital, as well as provincial level support on various projects and initiatives. She also provides consultant health ethics services to various organizations across Canada with a special focus on ethics analyses for health technology assessment. She was the advising ethicist on the British Columbia Health Technology Assessment Committee and provides ethics support for the Cancer Committee for the Health Research Ethics Board of Alberta. Dr. Victoria Siebert-Fine is also a clinical ethicist with Alberta Health Services with the primary responsibility of serving the central zone as well as providing provincial level support. On the national level, Victoria drafted the ethics framework for the second edition of the Canadian Tri-Council Policy Statement on Ethical Conduct for Research Involving Humans. She was a member of the Clinical Trials Committee with the Health Research Ethics Board of Alberta. She is currently the elected membership officer on the Canadian Bioethics Society Board of Directors. Without further ado, I turn it over to you both. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, as Michael mentioned, Catherine and I are both members of the Clinical Ethics Service in Alberta Health Services. Um, as part of that role, we do a range of different work, including ethics consultation, policy review, education, and support for organizational initiatives. And what we're going to be doing today is talking about the moral distress work that we've done over the last three or four years. Before we jump in, uh, one of the things that we typically do prior to a presentation on moral distress is to speak with uh, the people who have asked us to give the presentation ahead of time to get a sense of what their needs are for that presentation and what the challenges are that we're facing. Uh, so in view of that today, we just wanted to get a little bit of a sense of who was in our audience and what your primary interest is in moral distress. Uh, and that can might help us be able to target uh, uh, our, 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 our remarks a little bit today. So I'm going to ask Michael just to pop up the poll and just ask you to tell us a little bit about what your interest is in this topic. Uh, and that will allow us hopefully to have a really good conversation to draw in some of the expertise that you might have in this work as well. Excellent. So I think most people have, <clears throat> have answered, so we could share those results. Uh, and it looks like most people are here to learn more about moral distress, which is great. Um, and some of you, uh, some of you um, do also uh, teach, teach moral distress and research moral distress. Um, those of you who are experiencing moral distress, um, hope, I would hope this session may help help you as well. Uh, typically, generally, this is a little bit more of a broad presentation to address moral distress in general, but there hopefully there will be some strategies you might be able to take with you. So thank you very much uh, for filling out that poll. And um, you can maybe take that down. Wonderful. So thank you so much. And especially to those of you who do teach or research on moral distress, we're really hoping you can share some of the work that you do with us today, um, just to help uh, enhance our knowledge of this topic as well, the greater understanding of some of the different work that might be happening in different areas uh, within Alberta and beyond. So really encourage you to contribute some of your work in the Q&A as well. So what we're going to do today is just provide a bit of an overview of moral distress and some related concepts just to make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to share some of the strategies that we typically offer to participants that we speak to, as well as the resources that we provide. And then we're just going to share some of the highlights of the work that we've done throughout AHS over the last several years, ending with the lessons that we've learned from that work. So first, it's just worth noting that moral distress isn't new. Um, it has always been part of healthcare. It's a very complex system. People have really strong values about their health. So it's not going to be entirely avoidable. 
However, we have definitely seen an increase in the prevalence and incidence of moral distress over the last few years, and certainly the degree to which it's being talked about has increased an enormous amount. Um, Catherine and I and others of our colleagues within the Clinical Ethics Service have also been asked to provide presentations, debriefs, support, consultation on moral distress to a degree that we have never seen between these last, uh, before these last few years. So it's great that we're able to have this conversation about it today. Uh, the definition of moral distress that we like to use is this one by McCarthy, which is basically referring to the stress response. So the psycho-emotional physiological response is of an individual who feels unable to act consistently with their deeply held values. Um, so in other words, you may believe you know the right thing to do, but you're prevented from doing it because of certain kinds of constraints. Another term that we're hearing increasingly in healthcare is that of moral injury. Um, this is typically defined as the harm one suffers due to a violation of a deeply held moral belief. So obviously these definitions are quite similar. Um, moral injury arose from the military. It was a term that was coined when soldiers came back from war being changed from their experiences or what they saw or did um, when they were in war. And it was noted that their psychological states didn't fit into traditional pathology. Uh, so this term has uh, remained in the military. It's more dominant in the medical literature, um, whereas moral distress emerged from the nursing literature and is typically more discussed in the literature, in the healthcare literature. Some people do use these terms interchangeably. Um, some people also define moral injury as an escalation of moral distress. So moral, moral injury as being experienced after repeat incidences of moral distress or the consequence of really intense moral distress. So we typically re, um, refer to the term of moral distress because of its historical roots in healthcare and the greater history in the literature. But whichever you use, they're both obviously very damaging and they're the result of being unable to live up to a deeply held value. So our focus always in giving these presentations is to try to give people the language to talk about what they're experiencing um, and offer some strategies and suggestions of how they can address it in ways that are helpful to them. There are also other phenomena um, that we're hearing quite a lot in healthcare. Um, moral distress will not capture all of the difficult experiences or challenging emotions that people experience in healthcare. Um, some of these terms I'm sure are familiar to you and they might be better addressed by other trained professionals in these areas. It is worth noting though that people can experience many of these simultaneously and that there is overlap between them. So these can, these terms, these phenomena can um, reinforce each other, they can contribute to each other. Uh, and many of the strategies actually, in terms of the symptoms that are experienced by some of these may also be quite similar. Uh, as an example of some of their interrelation or their overlap, compassion fatigue could lead to moral distress if a healthcare provider feels that they're not able to interact with a patient in the way that they might, they, they would like, that is more reflective of a deeply held value, that could lead to moral distress. Someone who's experienced moral distress repeatedly and is unable to address that moral distress, that might result in burnout, which is essentially that chronic workplace stress. One way of capturing this relationship between moral distress and burnout can be done using Epstein and Heimrich's crescendo effect. This basically illustrates how the experience of moral distress can occur after an acute incident. After that situation has resolved or has passed, typically those, um, those stress responses decrease somewhat, but they don't necessarily go back to baseline unless some work is done to really resolve what has happened. Often there's some moral residue left or some lingering feeling of being compromised. Um, then what happens if another incident happens where a person experiences moral distress, that then the peak of their experience of moral distress will actually be higher. And this will continue throughout this crescendo until, for example, until the person um, might reach the end of that uh, chart where they might experience burnout, that sort of, um, that sort of patholo pathological response in the face of unrelenting or chronic stressors in the work environment. Uh, moral distress isn't the only cause of burnout. There were many other factors in a work environment that could contribute to burnout, but it certainly can be one of them. <laughs> 
when we talked about the definition of moral distress at the beginning, uh, we talked about um, not living up to a certain a deeply held value due to certain kinds of constraints. Um, McCarthy, the definition that we used, defines these constraints as institutional or other kinds of constraints. Um, the original sort of coined or most common definition of moral distress, which is given by Jameton in 1984 in the nursing literature, um, divided these constraints into internal and external constraints. Um, because these have been talked about a, a lot in the literature, these are the these are the categories that we tend to use and talk about. Um, but these these could be parsed out in different ways, and we know there is some research being done to sort of do more conceptual analysis to see if these constraints could be captured in in, in other kinds of more helpful ways. Um, what we have found in, in speaking about moral distress to many different groups throughout the organization over the past many years is that these cap here tend to really capture what they're experiencing um, and really do resonate across groups. How some of them are experienced by particular groups uh, might depend on their role or where they are within the organization, uh, but typically these do, um, th we have, these do seem to reflect what people are experiencing. Uh, so just to kind of review what they are, um, the internal constraints can include a feeling of powerlessness. So feeling like you're unable to make a difference or advocate successfully. Um, this could just be the result of the hierarchy in healthcare. Um, so not being feeling in, not being in a position to have power or authority. Um, but we have also spoken to many senior leaders who also describe feeling powerless. So this also seems um, common across across the organization. People might also feel they don't have enough information to take action. So they don't have an adequate enough understanding of the situation. They don't have all the facts. Uh, they don't have the full picture. Again, this might be very reasonable for anyone in healthcare because it is such a large and complex system. Um, it might also be exacerbated if somebody is new in a role um, or working in a new environment um, or in a context where there has been a lot of change. Relationships is one area that we found to be incredibly significant in healthcare. Um, these, having good working relationships is really essential to the work of doing healthcare. Um, relationships of um, direct care providers with their patients, with loved ones, is obviously very important to everyone's experience of their health. Of their health. Um, relationships between professionals, between professionals in different systems, different sites, different programs can be very crucial to that whole um, continuum of care taking place. So these relationships are really important. It can be very damaging um, to that workflow and to people's job satisfaction if those relationships are damaged. This fear of causing waves may also be particularly expressed or experienced by people who are new, um, who are early in their career, or who are integrating into a new team um, or integrating into a new setting where there's really quite a lot of focus at establishing good working relationships to have good working relationships going forward. Um, so these might all be constraints that might prevent somebody from taking action where they feel like a value is being compromised. There are several external constraints that also seem to be very relevant to people. One is, in particular, is the competing demands that so many people have on their time, um, on their energy and their attention just in their work life. And this is just the result of being pulled in so many different directions. Um, it's exacerbated by resource constraints and the staffing shortages that we have now, where people just have very heavy workloads. Um, if you're a leader, this might be a, the administrative burden. Um, direct care providers can be your your patient load. Um, just having a significant volume of gents trying to do a lot of work in a short uh, amount of time. People also have many responsibilities in their work, and often these responsibilities can entail obligations that can also create conflicts for us. Uh, so for example, um, Direct care providers have obligations to their patients, um, also to colleagues, so not wanting to let colleagues down, wanting to support colleagues, all to their managers. And again, if they're working with other teams or other professionals in a small space or in a crowded space, and other professionals who are all navigating the same systems pressures, these can also create some uh, competing obligations. Leaders also have obligations to patients, often patient groups, um, to their direct reports, so to their staff, um, as well as to their managers, and sometimes often to budgets, 
And then everyone also has responsibilities um, outside of work, right, to their families in their personal lives. And it just may not be possible to live up to all of these obligations at the same time. And lastly, this is kind of hearkening back to McCarthy's comment about constraints often being institutional. Um, not every individual who experiences moral distress will be in a position where they can do much about it. Um, so there are, uh, there are decisions, there are policy directions, there are priorities that are set higher up in AHS, in the organization, or in some cases outside of AHS, such as with our provincial government, um, our federal government, um, Health Canada, or other environmental bodies that do affect available services, resources, priorities in ways where an individual healthcare provider or leader may have limited influence. So however you choose to frame these constraints, I think it's fairly um, sort of, these are all constraints that people do face in their work um, and will potentially have an, have an influence on how they're able to act on a deeply held value. So no matter where people are situated within the healthcare system, there tend to be some core values tension that they face in their work. So what we try to do when we're presenting to different groups is to highlight the main values tension they experience and sometimes framing it in that way or naming it can be really helpful for them to recognize why they're facing such a struggle in their work. So the one that is sort of most dominant and most common across all groups that we speak to is this tension between meeting the needs of the population as a whole um, and still trying to uphold the needs of individuals. So obviously in a healthcare system, especially where it's overburdened, there is a need to be efficient with system resources, uh, to use the resources in particular areas of the system in inappropriate ways for the, for the, the population that it's designed to meet. Uh, and sometimes this can mean um, prioritizing the needs of, of the population as a whole um, and can mean the needs of individuals aren't met as well as we might hope. Um, or the needs of individual patients are compromised in some way, for example, due to constraints on resources. So being admitted into hallways or tub rooms um, or being discharged from acute care sicker or earlier than they might have other way otherwise, um, or just other ways where it's just not possible to meet all of those individual needs. Another kind of collection of values tensions that we sometimes talk about, again, depending on the context or the group that we're speaking to, can be this tension between addressing the acute presenting cause versus what might be a more chronic or underlying cause of somebody's health concerns. For example, if somebody is working in an emergency setting, um, it might be obviously very important to address that acute presenting issue. Um, but someone who's used to working in different work environment, like continuing care or other, other areas of acute care, might be very challenged in not a, being able to address the more comprehensive care that they might have been used to in another setting or that they might define as kind of being important for them in their role. Another tension that sometimes arises with some groups is this tension between trying to uphold the public good, trying to do the best one can, one can, recognizing that um, people do have significant health care needs and the system is very strained. So feeling like um, this is reflect a little bit of the, uh, the literature around the sort of culture of medicine as being or as healthcare as being kind of altruistic or self-sacrificial, that people really need to put the interests of patients first. Uh, and this can sometimes mean working longer hours, taking on extra shifts, taking on bigger patient panels, um, which could mean that the individual um, provider is not, is, is not taking care of themselves in the way that they should, or it just has some significant per for personal cost for that healthcare provider. It's also important to note, I think, that these values tensions um, aren't necessarily, they aren't necessarily avoidable. Um, and also these value trade-offs in many cases are justified. For example, in an emergency setting, it is important <laughs> that we prioritize those acute emergent issues. Otherwise, emergency rooms would be walk-in clinics um, and there wouldn't be the, the capacity to address uh, emergent trauma um, incidences that people experience with their health. So these value chairs may be absolutely justified. If people experience moral distress from them, it doesn't necessarily mean that something wrong has happened. 
Um, but it does mean that an important value, something that people thought was really important to them, has been sacrificed. And so that's important, I think, to recognize and to address. Unfortunately, even if a value trade-off is justified, it does mean, as I've said, that an important value has been compromised. And this can be damaging because it means something you felt was really important to you is not, is not something you've been able to live up to. And this is important primarily because of the concept of integrity. So integrity just means our sense of wholeness when we're able to act on the values that we believe to be deeply important. So that gives us our sense of integrity. Um, if we're not able to act on the values that believe, we believe to be dip, deeply important to us, this can actually be quite damaging to us or fracturing to us as a person. This disconnection can also affect our sense of identity since our values actually shape us, shape the people that we think there are. They're, our values are identity conforming in some way. Um, so the experiences of moral distress can then also uh, damage our sense of integrity um, or what, what it means for us to be a good person or a good healthcare provider if we feel that we're consistently not able to live up to those values. The consequences of this disintegration or this damage to integrity can be manifest itself in a number of different ways. Um, it can have many, many emotional consequences in terms of feeling anger, uh, frustration, sadness, guilt, shame, or self-doubt. It can cause people to feel belittled or unimportant or unintelligent. It can cause us to feel a loss of meaning in our work or a lack of connection to the things that matter to us. It can also lead to a number of physical symptoms, including nausea, headaches, and sleep disturbances. It can cause us to withdraw from others and avoid social interactions. And all of these can have consequences for patient care. So with, it can cause people to withdraw from their patients or clients, and it can result in a decline in quality of care. And it can also have an implication on one's professional role. So it can lead to poor job satisfaction. It can lead to people being absent more often. And it can ultimately lead to people leaving the profession um, if it isn't able to be addressed. So obviously, because of all of these consequences of moral distress, we do want to try to address it and mitigate it wherever possible and even avoid the experience of it where it's possible to do so. So we are now going to turn to looking at some of the strategies that might be helpful to try to address people's moral distress. Uh, and before we do that, we're just going to watch uh, a little bit of a lighthearted video uh, about ways uh, not to do this. Uh, sir, you wanted to see me? Yes, Bill, please, come in. Okay. Bill, it's been brought to my attention that you haven't done any of your resiliency modules. Oh, yeah. You do know that physician burnout is a huge problem right now. Yeah, I know. So what do you think we should do about physician burnout? Um, more days off? No! A mandatory eight-part online curriculum designed by people who have never taken care of patients. Really? That's the best way? Of course it is, but how can we measure your gains in resiliency and ultimately publish it in the New England Journal if you don't finish the modules? I mean, I could just tell you right now it's not going to make me feel better. Whoa, we'll let the four-page self-assessment questionnaire answer that. Oh god, what if I don't do it? Well, then you'll have to complete a three-hour course on the importance of professionalism. Fine, but can I at least have the afternoon off to finish the modules? No, you can become resilient on your own time. All right, I'll, I'll jump in from here. So, um, of course, that was about burnout, but I think it's it speaks to a little bit about this idea of moral distress and what kind of problem it is and what sorts of responses and solutions uh, we should be advocating for. And so the first thing that uh, that we think is important to point out, and we certainly do point this out or to the people that we present to in our moral distress sessions, is that Moral distress really is a multi-level systemic problem, and it's not something that can be resolved or should be taken on to resolve or addressed by any particular level. When I was doing my uh, doctoral research uh, many, many years ago, more than I care to admit now, my reading of the moral distress literature at that point was that there was still a, a fairly strong focus on individual strategies, on coping, 
and response, uh, rather than a recognition of the upstream causes of moral distress and the factors within organizations that may um, either generate or exacerbate moral distress as it occurs. So we are trying to send the message in our work in AHS to many different levels that this is a systemic issue. It's not simply a, a direct care provider concern um, and it does require multiple responses. And, and that's something that we want to make clear to people when we do our um, sessions, especially those who are uh, for direct care providers because we don't want to send the message that it's just up to them to deal with, that we also want to let them know that we see that it is a systems problem and that we are also trying to call on other levels of the organization to see that as well. So when we think about strategies, one of the first things that as an ethicist, Victor or Victoria and I think about is this idea of values. And when I say values, what I'm, and Victoria's mentioned this term a few times, we're really talking about in, in more simple terms, what's important to us as individuals, as professionals, as members of a healthcare team, as society, as a health system, we all, there's a, a series of values that tend to be relevant in any particular situation. And as Victoria mentioned, in moral distress is by definition uh, an experience that occurs when we aren't acting in ways that are consistent with our deeply held values. And so one of the things that we, we think is important or could be helpful to people when grappling with moral distress is to try and think more deeply what matters to me? What's important to me? Um, what am I not achieving or delivering on when I'm in the situation that has caused moral distress? And we think that this is valuable to engage in this kind of reflection for a number of reasons. Um, one is that it can help us generate a bit more clarity about where our moral distress is coming from, what it is that we are not delivering on that is creating the distress. And in doing that reflection allows for us to hold the, the struggle at arm's length, which can be useful a little bit to kind of separate it from ourself or from that direct impact on our well-being and, and identity. And it also helps us to think about what are our core values that we think are important as we come into work every day that we want to uh, align with, that we want other people to know that we are committed to. Um, and set, with that clarity, we can look for ways to deliver on those values, even if they're going to be circumstances where we aren't actually going to be acting consistently with them. And that's one of the big, the big strategies is ultimately to try and generate uh, be develop um, actions and plans to act in ways that are more consistent with our values um, to overall be able to maintain that integrity as we do our work, even though we know that that is never going to be perfect. So we um, wanted to uh, just show you again some of the strategies. The, what we have here on this slide are the kinds of strategies that we um, would present more directly to direct to care providers. Uh, we'll have a, I'll present a second slide which elaborates it, elaborates this a little bit more on um, how managers or leaders may may experience moral distress and respond to it as well. So the first thing that um, that I just mentioned is this idea of connecting with what's important and to try and encourage people to think a little bit more deeply about what matters to them and what they're not able to deliver on in that situation that's morally distressing. And again, finding uh, strategies or actions that they can take to act in accordance with those values more often or in, in a broader kind of approach to their work. The next thing that we talk about, and I always feel a little bit insecure mentioning this to people because it always sounds so obviously true and a little bit trite, but to really emphasize the importance of having safe and supportive relationships in the workplace with colleagues, um, with leaders where possible as well. Um, because these are the, the places where, of course, we, there's the benefit of camaraderie. We're working with, with people who understand the context, which sometimes is very incomprehensible to people outside of healthcare. But it's also a type of relationship at times where you might be able to have those conversations about what's more deeply important in terms of uh, what we're doing, what matters to you. So that can be a clarifying type of relationship if people are able to have conversations in those sorts of ways. Similarly, connecting with teams or peers in informal settings, uh, again, can be a source, uh, not only just of fun and, and kind of mixing it up at work, but also can be protective and enable that kind of relationship that I think is, is more effective at assisting people to address their moral distress or strategize 
to plan for anticipated moral distress as well. And so when we tell people this in our sessions, we say, look, you know, we know this sounds obvious, but what we want to, the message we want to send to you is that this is not only kind of a nice to have, but actually very crucially important for your own well-being and sense of integrity in your work. So something to take a little bit more seriously and to pursue with a little bit more intention. Another category of strategies has to do with how people make meaning in their roles and how they interpret their environment and the stories they tell about themselves. And we are always telling stories in a sense to ourselves to make sense of all of the data and input sensory input we're getting at any given time. And sometimes those interpretations or stories can be constructive to our own sense of well-being. And sometimes they are less constructive and possibly destructive. So we, we like to ask, you know, what stories are you telling yourself about what's going on here? And can you tell yourself a different story? Can you reinterpret the same input in a way that would be more constructive and more helpful for your own sense of place and integrity in that environment? This work uh, approach had, was brought forward most famously by Viktor Frankl, who is an Austri Aust Austrian psychiatrist who, is, um, who spent several years in a concentration camp and, and in his book um, identifies the value of narration of what's going on and interpreting his experiences in ways that he credits with uh, enabling him to come out of that very horrific experience with a greater sense of wholeness. So we're not trying to equate healthcare with concentration camps, of course, but we do think there's some value, again, in being critical and reflective about how we are conceiving of our role, of the organization, of the intentions of the people around us, of the reasons for what's going on, and, and being um, open to the potential that there may be equally valid interpretations and stories that could assist us to, uh, to maintain our own sense of integrity and well-being a little bit better. You know, we do talk about very briefly focusing on things you can control and trying not to focus on things you can't. Um, and also trying to talk about how we can make uh, learn from the difficulty that we are experiencing. So these are things that we can do to try and um, come away from maybe a, a, a pretty negative experience to say, well, what would we do differently? What came out of that? What would what what lessons have we learned for ourselves or others that we could put forward to try and avoid this in the future? And that can also contribute to a sense of developing meaning out of um, out of uh, you know a distressing situation or or a negative situation. One of the other things that we talk a lot about, and as Victoria mentioned briefly, we've we've presented to multiple kind of levels within the organization within the HS. So to kind of quite senior leadership teams to kind of um, managers, to program leads, to direct care providers. And, and one of the great challenges uh, within such a large organization is the communication of, um, of reasons for decisions and the impacts that the decisions are having. So that lack of information flow. And it's just a, a brutally difficult thing to do to have very clear messages and understanding and message and experiences traveling between multiple levels in our organization. And so we have talked again with, with leaders also to encourage them to try and share rationales for decisions that are occurring and for people who are experiencing the impacts of decisions or guidelines or policies to be encouraged to share those impacts back to those leaders. And that for all parties to see that as an important aspect of being a learning organization rather than seeing it as complaining or, or that kind of a thing. And we have heard a couple of examples over the last few years where um, a decision was made where the full impacts were not accurately anticipated. And then upon, upon hearing some of those impacts at the direct care level, uh, the decision was reversed. And there is a real value in trying to be open to those conversations. And as a person who may be say a subject to those sorts of decisions, it can alleviate moral distress by having a broader picture of the considerations and sometimes the values or reasons that went into the decision and also can be empowering for everybody to have more information again to assess the situation and to either act or to reframe their understanding of what's going on, which can sometimes um, mitigate moral distress that would otherwise have occurred. So as I mentioned, we do also, uh, or we have done quite a few uh, sessions for leaders within AHS. We found quite early on um, in the pandemic period that managers felt an immense amount of moral distress and also 
um, generally felt that their uh, experiences and concerns were not uh, that well recognized, nor were they receiving that much support for the challenges that they were facing. And so we did do uh, quite a few interviews with leadership around in our respective areas to try and get a sense of what life has been like for them. And this was right at the kind of pre-height height of the pandemic. So uh, a, a unique situation, though I think some of their challenges and concerns are echoed now with our, our current scenario, which is also quite challenging. And so with that, um, with hearing from them, we developed some sessions specifically for leaders, which talked about their own moral distress and against strategies to address and, and, and respond to that, but also to recognize their roles as nodes within the organization that either can help people manage their distress effectively or to actually make it worse. Um, and though there hasn't been too, too much literature on, on leadership moral distress, although there is a small literature and, and some of the things that we've found by reviewing that literature um, have shown us that and other literature as well, that, that these managers can have quite a big impact. But there's also some things we can point out that can be protective for them in their role. One of the first things we 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 say, and again, one of the things that kind of sounds too obvious even to say, but there's the importance of acknowledging and validating distress. And in various literatures to do with either moral injury or moral distress, we've seen um, the consequences of people who identify their distress to somebody else who they may perceive could or should be in a role to help them do something about that and having that distress or injury be dismissed or not validated. So in the moral distress literature, that's described as uh, secondary distress, which can actually be even more harmful than the initial um, experience of moral distress. Um, and in the moral injury literature, we sometimes see that described as sanctuary trauma. So when people are going into a place where they feel that they should be safe, they should expect support um, when they actually don't get any of that. And that can be very damaging as well. Leaders also can have a role in having even short conversations to try and help people get a deeper sense of the values at play for them. You know, so what's going on for you? Why does this matter? What would what solution do you think would work better? What would you change to again, somewhat simple questions that can be asked to try and get a deeper sense of of that? What is causing that disintegration between action and that person's values? Things that we've talked about already about helping others to find meaning in their work and also adopting an openness to hearing um, the impacts that certain decisions or the organizational function is having for people and seeing that as valuable information um, rather than uh, perhaps another way people might see that as kind of complaining, um, but we're recognizing that there is value in hearing that perspective from, from direct reports. And then, of course, to the extent that managers and leaders are able to create opportunities to learn, to do team reviews or debriefs and informal interactions, that's in other ways in which um, uh, leaders might be able to assist, um, again, their staff and, and others in the organization. There are also broader systems level strategies that we could be using as well. Um, so this, these are things that you know, no one individual has a, the, an easy way of, of generating, although I think uh, I would say that some of what AHS has been trying to do over the years and what we've tried to support falls into these categories. Um, but things like supportive relationships between leaders, uh, there is some evidence in the literature to show that that is one of uh, the key protective factors for leaders' moral distress. Um, again, sharing that rationale for decisions and policies, being open to hearing impacts, recognizing the existence and impact of moral distress, and we hope we've been contributing to that conversation within AHS. Um, and supporting managers to have more accessible skills and tools to try to acknowledge and respond to moral distress that they hear from their direct reports. And just in general, normalizing discussions of ethics issues or the ethical aspects of our work uh, can all be useful and helpful ways to take a more sy systematic and systemic focus on uh, minimizing and mitigating the impacts of moral distress. So we'll switch a little bit now to tell you what we have been um, up to here uh, within AHS. So um, we, as Victoria mentioned, we've seen an increase in um, uh, you know, re requests for support for moral distress, which to us suggests there may be an increased incidence in moral distress as well. 
over the last four years, we've done not just Victoria and I, but looking at the entire clinical ethics service uh, at AHS, over 80 sessions. Um, and these are very in format and length somewhat, uh, depending on the need and the context of the requester and the intended audience. Uh, but we have, as I mentioned already, done um, sessions geared towards direct care providers and then also leaders at various levels, whether that's program managers, practice leads, um, uh, right up to quite senior levels of the organization. We've also worked with quite a broad range of disciplinary groups. So pharmacists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, mental health therapists, case managers, transition coordinators, program leaders, practice leaders, et cetera, et cetera, including physicians and nursing as well. Um, which, you know, I think reflects that moral distress can occur for just about anybody within the organization. Um, and, and it is something that, uh, that we are trying to respond within those disciplines. And, you know, I haven't done a deep dive into the moral distress literature over the last five years. I did a very cursory non-scientific review uh, over the, uh, through Google Scholar about what's been published in the last two or three years. And overall, it seems very still quite focused on direct care providers and quite focused on nursing. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can broaden that research focus to also take a look at other disciplines as well to see how uh, they may be experiencing and what barriers and, um, and solutions might be assisting to them as well. Uh, we both, yeah, Victoria and I both did display tables on moral distress at site-wide events. Uh, these were uh, events that were meant to be supportive for staff wellness. Um, one of them was a post-COVID kind of grief and support event at the Royal Alex, where we walked people through uh, kind of a self-guided reflection uh, on, on their experiences through the pandemic and more broadly. We also did an AH, AHS-wide survey in preparation for a um, our people strategy initiative. So this is an initiative that's run by outside of clinical ethics where they organize top um, presentations for AHS-wide presentations on particular topics of interest. And as part of that, we um, put together a survey on moral distress. And uh, we had 1,400 respondents uh, across all levels of the organization um, and, uh, and found that unsurprisingly, the majority of people who responded, which of course is a self-selected group, but uh, had experienced or were, was experiencing moral distress, on a regular basis. One of the things that came out of that survey was uh, the impact of our um, policies and guidelines on visitor access during the pandemic was a significant source of moral distress for uh, many people, especially those at the direct care level. And so we organized um, an event where it was meant to be kind of a debrief slash information sharing session about the visitor guidelines. Um, and we brought together um, the people who developed those guidelines, health leaders and others in the organization to be available to kind of speak to how they came about and why they came about and to be available for questions and for having to have people have the opportunity to share their own experiences of the impact of that. Um, it was one of those examples of things that may have had or probably had strong ethical justification, but nevertheless was significantly morally distressing for the people who were on the phones telling loved ones they couldn't come to visit their dying relative or having family come in one at a time and, and it implementing and enforcing those restrictions or guidelines at that time. Uh, the other thing that um, we've done just alongside was try and develop some tools um, and resources that we hope people could take away and review uh, on their own or try and implement in their own areas or with our assistance if they needed. And this includes um, the uh, lit review. Uh, we de developed a debriefing tool, which is a stepwise process that people can go through individually or as a team to reflect on um, a particularly uh, morally distressing event to identify strategies and plans for how to respond and move forward from that. And also a uh, resource guide, guide was developed, which brings together AHS and outside resources uh, to make available for people to want to learn more about moral distress and to try and seek out other resources that might be helpful for them. Um, so if we look back to that, um, or think back at least to that triangle that I had on the slide before about the organizational responses to moral distress, we're hoping that we are trying to live up to what we're asking for by setting up um, 
setting up opportunities that raise the question and share the language of moral distress at multiple levels. We've also found that by engaging in this work, we've been able to connect with other resources within AHS that are in place to pr pr protect and promote the well-being of staff, including uh, workplace workplace health and safety and their work on psychological safety, um, medical affairs work on physician burnout. Um, and we've also been able to bring the conversation into areas that we hadn't been able to before. Uh, Victoria was invited to do a, a video log, a vlog with uh, the CEO Moro Cheese at that time. Um, and we've just been able to bring this conversation to multiple levels in the way that we hope is not only giving people the tools themselves to address moral distress, but also trying to uh, attack this, or that's not the great word, but address this at multiple levels of the organization too. Um, so we'll just uh, move forward to lessons learned. Um, Victoria is just going to pop, that's our resource guide, that's what it looks like, um, on our debriefing guide as well, and those are available on Insight, and we can also share those if you don't um, have access to that particular um, intranet. Okay, so what have we learned from doing all of this? Uh, so our usual session for this has been to do a bit of education for 30 minutes and then to allow for about 30 minutes, sometimes longer, for discussion and questions. And we find that this combination of education and debrief strikes a good balance between introducing the ideas and concepts and then giving people a chance to identify in their own experiences and reflections about moral distress. Um, we also have really found that it's crucial to prepare for these and to try and um, we always, whenever someone asks for a session, we always ask for a meeting with them and maybe some of their colleagues to get a better sense of why they're asking, of what the challenges are that they or their colleagues or their direct reports are facing. So that can, we can really tailor our content and our comments in ways that are most accessible and uh, meaningful to our participants, or at least our, our best guess at what would be helpful. We also uh, try to identify uh, internal constraints or characteristics and external constraints that may be most relevant or in, kind of articulate those in ways that we hope resonates with the challenges that people are facing. We would identify those key values tensions and, 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 I, and kind of share those back to people to say, this is what we think might be going on. Are we getting this right? Does this sound right to you? Is this what one of the challenges are? Um, and it really, I think, helps us to make sure we're trying to be as useful to our audience and also gives them the language and we speak about moral distress in a language that we hope they can use to continue to reflect on this challenge in their own context. We've also learned a little bit about timing. Um, having a moral distress session at the height of distress or trauma within a team or when there is very little time for the team to take a breath and even take one step back is not necessarily that effective. So we try and make sure that we're able to time the session in a way that uh, people are able to take a moment to look back or to step back from their current challenges and think about them um, so that we're being fair and realistic in what we're asking people to do at the time of the session. And we've also worked um, to uh, identify opportunities to be proactive. So um, we've done a few sessions for teams that are just starting a new role or integrating into a new environment where they've either haven't started or have only been there for you know, a couple of weeks and where some new context may generate values tensions that, that could plausibly or will be expected to generate moral distress for them. So uh, one example of that is uh, of some teams moving into the emergency room, some new allied health positions in the emergency room. Um, and as Victoria mentioned, the, that's a context where the focus and the intent of that service is different from other areas and where we may find ourselves in that conflict between addressing acute versus chronic issues or symptoms versus causes um, and supporting staff to think about what they might be experiencing and to plan ahead, what relationships might they need? How will they think about this environment? What will they do to either prevent moral distress or mitigate it or minimize the harms of distress when it inevitably happens? And that's something we would like to do more about. And I, I noticed that there's a number of people who are here today who are preparing students or teaching students who are about to come into healthcare. And this also, I think, would be a good example of anticipatory work to uh, for moral distress or preparatory moral distress work so that rather than waiting for the distress to happen and being reactive to that to actually say okay we know this is going to occur how are we going to set up 
our, our, our lives, our professional environments to manage this as well as possible. The other, we also try and look at um, knowing when we shouldn't do this at all. So I talked about timing and sometimes there are circumstances where a moral distress debrief is not what people need, um, either because the, the, the real challenge is something else. Maybe it's burnout, maybe it's trauma, maybe it's grief. Um, or where uh, our strategies would would be um, potentially sounding as though we're suggesting things to people that they've already tried, or where people perceive that the cause of the moral distress is an organizational thing that could, in their view, be changed easily um, and is simply not. And so we have to talk carefully with, especially with our requesters, which are, tend to be leaders of these groups, to say, is this something that could help or could this harm in some way and want to be you know, knowing when to say, you know, I'm not sure this is what we should be doing right away. Um, and I guess the other thing to point out before we finish is just to be realistic about our intentions and what our sessions can do. Our one hour session is not the solution to moral distress. What we're trying to do is, again, to give people the language and to the strategies to do more work in the future, which we hope will be helpful. We don't want people to think that if they call us and do this session, they can kind of tick their moral distress box. Um, and we certainly uh, we try and make sure that people understand that when we we follow through on a request and are realistic for ourselves about what we're actually able to accomplish. So I think with that, we will allow for not as much time as I had hoped, um, but for some discussion, comments, reflections, challenge, whatever you'd like to say, we're happy to hear it. So thank you so much.